Um, and I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, Cal Barrett. Um, she's an associate professor of anthropology at Oberlin College. And today she's going to be talking about work from her recent book uh, called Cooking Data, Culture and Politics in an African Research World. And in the book, Cal says that she attempted to um, keep data themselves at the center of the story without losing sight of the people, places, and things that cohere around them. Um, and as you would expect from an anthropologist, she's managed to do that beautifully in the book. Uh, so it narrates what goes on behind the scenes in the production of global health statistics, um, from the intimate exchanges between field workers and research subjects to the ritualistic nature of informed consent and the creativity and improvisation that go into um, data standardization. Um, but it also really demonstrates the way lives and policies and knowledge and cultures um, both produce and are produced by data. So in other words, it really helps us to understand um, how data is a consequence in the world. Uh, and I'm really excited to now turn the floor over to her. And um, we will have time for questions at the end, so uh, we'll get questions for that. Okay. Um, thanks, Anusa, for the introduction, um, and thanks to you and Dave for inviting me today. Um, thanks to everyone here for, for joining us. Um, so I organized my talk today as a kind of montage of fragments drawn from the book. Um, and I'll start off by asking this very deceptively simple question, so what's in a number? Um, and this is the question that kind of really motivated my book project um, and I think takes on crucial significance in a moment where data as thing and as rhetoric uh, has immense value as the grounds or justification for projects across a wide variety of sectors, whether climate change, global health, human trafficking, whatever it might be. Um, data, of course, are useful instruments for measuring measuring phenomena, determining how to solve problems, uh, working toward improvements. Rarely, however, do most people take pause to consider where they come from uh, and how their modes of collection and circulation might inflect the claims they make about people, places, and things. So cooking data, um, I hope, invites us to see data as socially produced and politically potent and um, adopt a critical stance or perhaps a kind of data literacy that might um, move toward eroding the mystique of data of all kinds. So the data that are under discussion today, some of the material artifacts of those data here, um, they're, they're kind of the data that scholars in data studies would consider to be small data um, rather than big data. Um, so they're collected periodically by American or European-led demographic survey projects from rural Malawian households in order to track changes over time um, in economic trends, agricultural yields, HIV prevalence, fertility, food security, um, and the list goes on. So I I, I was kind of an anthropologist among the demographers, um, immersed as I was in everyday survey data collection, um, and, and I was kind of an interested observer who took up positions on what demographers imagined to be um, ideally an assembly line of data, uh, but you know, as I try to show in the book, uh, really kind of turns out to be more like a life course uh, in practice, where any individual datum results from unfolding transactions and relations. So these projects are, of course, recognizable as part of the 20th century rise of infrastructures of family planning, development, global health, and NGO efforts to govern the categories of population and economy. Following Michelle Murphy, they enact a biopolitics that is an alibi for nurturing or disinvesting from issues, groups of people, topics, and infrastructures that support them. So for example, data and units of information written onto pages by field workers for the projects I'll discuss today might go on to become evidence for where resources should or should not be directed. And here I've just put up um, the first page of uh, one of the projects I'll be discussing today, um, just to give you a sense of kind of the aesthetics of the, the survey questionnaire itself, um, and so that you can begin to think about sort of the immense amount of labor um, that goes into uh, writing onto these pages and documenting information um, in the correct and standardized manner. Um, and of course, the survey form, the, the questionnaire form in general, kind of acts as a material archive in and itself. Um, of the sort of interests that demographers 
have had and the kinds of phenomena they've studied over time. So as most of you know, longitudinal studies, generally the questions themselves remain stagnant, but often you can add other questions on. So this particular survey um, that I'm showing here uh, was 30 pages um, in the field season that, that I was with the project. Um, it would take anywhere from like an hour to three hours uh, for the respondent to um, engage the interviewer and for it to be completed. This is a household roster I'm sure recognizable to many of you. It's pretty characteristic of these kinds of um, surveys as they're administered uh, in places like Malawi. So an extensive literature authored by statisticians and survey researchers aims to diagnose, document, uh, mitigate instances of cooking or data fabrication by data collectors who are typically cast as liabilities to good data. However, accounts of data practices in the field take for granted uh, a fundamental difference between raw and cooked data. Um, a binary my book destabilizes, building of course on work by Jeffrey Boker, Lisa Gittleman, um, David, and, and others. So anthropology and demography presume very different orientations to numbers, as most of you are probably aware. Um, and, you know, Carolyn Bladso's work on fertility surveys in the Gambia has, has shown that really well, where she actually uses um, uh, Gambian conceptions of the life course of fertility and so on to actually speak back to and critique concepts that demographers take for granted as universal. Um, yet, I want to make clear that cooking data does not argue that the data produced by survey projects are fabricated or falsified. Um, and this is how I can tell if someone's read my book or not, because um, people think that's what it's going to be about. Um, nor do I argue that demographic data are bad. It doesn't provide sort of packaged advice to researchers about how to mitigate cooking among field workers. Um, my book instead tries to show in a fine-grained way how all data, even that verified as clean, is cooked in its processes and practices of production. So um, just kind of a brief interlude on kind of methods or methodology. Um, I'll be talking about two projects mainly today in the talk. Um, the book itself talks more broadly about four projects, um, but I've taken fragments only from these two today. Um, and I've given them awkward acronyms, MAPE and LSAM. And um, these, these projects sort of were longitudinal cohort studies um, panel, panel surveys. Um, and of course, that means these projects, um, and particularly this second one, LSAM, um, you know, has sampled over 4,000 people. And they follow them right over the course of a very long period of time, literally tracking the same person from the same household, um, or attempting to um, year after year, or field season after field season. Um, um, and the, the projects that I worked with were all administering questionnaires. Some of them collected also other forms of data um, and not necessarily from the whole sample, so some from like slices of that sample in a given year, given field season. Um, and so that's kind of a, a brief overview of the projects I'm discussing. I'll also be briefly um, mentioning some of the actors that are involved in these projects. Um, for the most part, I focus uh, today on fieldwork supervisors and data collectors. So when I say supervisor, um, I'm referring to college educated, uh, typically um, people who are overseeing fieldwork everyday practices. And uh, when I say field worker, more generally, or data collector, I'm generally referring to the people who are actually administering the questionnaires. Um, and those folks tend to be, um, tend to have a secondary school uh, leaving certificate. So they've kind of uh, attained a high school education in most cases. Though um, jobs are so scarce, which is they actually, um, these jobs are very high in demand, even though they pay very low. Um, um, and so uh, the data collectors sometimes did end up having as well a college education um, in some cases. OK. Um, so my talk today, like my book, foregrounds data's materiality and social lives as they progress through what I kind of call their life course, bookended by survey design, we might say the birth of the survey, and dissemination of findings drawn from cleaned data. So the chapters of the book loosely follow this arc from survey design and translation to training of field workers to ensuring data collection meets ethical standards, to survey administration, and finally to presentation of findings at conferences or policy forums. So I participated in some way in all these stages of making data. Um, as a, a sort of naive demographer, I'm not trained in demography. And um, that had both benefits and detriments to the project I was able to do. Um, and you know, I think in the end, it was actually beneficial in the sense that I was describing something that was kind of unfamiliar to me um, from an external position, but at the same time, learning some of the capacities and, and actually coming to embody some of the standards and things like that that were being taught to the, the field workers, um, among whom I would count 
myself in some sense, and I'll talk about that more at the end. Um, okay, so the book's emphasis is on showing how a set of epistemic criteria creates the human and social scaffolding for their implementation and to what ends. So my talk today has three sections. First, I'll elaborate on the title, explaining why I decided to call it Cooking Data. Um, and then I will share fragments from three chapters of the book. I like telling stories with objects, so I actually brought some props. Um, and I've organized the talk around three different objects that feature in the book, soap, beans, and a piece of African cloth. So each of these seemingly minor objects really does reveal how data collection happens in a socio-technical infrastructure that variously enhances and disrupts the epistemic standards and blueprints or recipes implemented by demographers. So the middle three sections of the talk think about how data do more than merely count or miscount, get things wrong or right. They assemble specific kinds of relations and transactions around them. Um, I would say they make social worlds and people as much as they measure them. So I'll conclude by gesturing toward and speculating about something I've been thinking about lady, lately, what ethnography of numbers um, or anthropology more broadly might contribute to critical data studies, uh, particularly amid the rise of, of the phenomena of big data. OK, so, um, so cooking data, sorry. Uh, in 1948, C.J. Martin, director of the East African Statistical Department, speculated that African data collectors for the census in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania might invent the data they were meant to record. He suggested, quote, it was necessary to be sure the African chosen would undertake his work efficiently and successfully, as with a period of only a few days to be employed, he might be tempted to sit under a banana tree and write the first figures which come into his head onto the census form, unquote. Sixty years later, I sat with a team of Malawian data collectors in a minibus parked in a village in central Malawi, where they were administering household level surveys for an American-led project, uh, which I call LSAM. They had finished their work for the day and were conversing about one of their colleagues as he sat under a tree nearby, as we sort of see here. Um, as he checked the questionnaire to ensure that each question had been answered by the respondent, those in the van jokingly accused him of cooking data, using um, the Chichewa word uh, for cooking as in the kitchen. Soon after, the money bus hurried back to the field office nearby, where completed questionnaires were deposited in cardboard boxes to be entered into a database. So cooking data, as you may know, refers to fabricating, falsifying, or fudging the information one is meant to collect in a standardized and clean manner in, in the sense it's being used here. Martin's fears that enumerators would, quote, write the first figures that came into their heads on their forms reflect his stakes in the endeavor to accurately map African populations in the territories his office oversaw, express, of course, racialized hierarchies of suspicion that continue to permeate research cultures today, and illustrate how data collectors' practices in the field might spoil census data that would later be analyzed in the office. Um, so they would sort of ruin raw data, right, meaning to transform it in the wrong way. And I think, of course, the suspicion invisibilizes, right, how the assumptions of ways and ways of seeing that sort of prefigure what constitutes data even before they are collected are likewise a form of cooking, perhaps. Um, and it also obscures how the labor of data cleaning, editing, scrubbing, removing corrupt data, illogical values, or fixing errors that happens after data is collected likewise packages it for consumption. Um, so meanwhile, in 2008, the phrase cooking data operated among field workers as playful commentary on colleagues' work performance, indicating they had come to articulate and embody the habits, investments, and standards central to the collection of high-quality data imparted to them by American demographers during pre-fieldwork training sessions. The phrase belies tensions between standardization and improvisation, and concerns about data quality that are at the very core of my book, and continue to preoccupy those who administer surveys in Africa and elsewhere for that matter today. Talk of raw and cooked data recalls Claude Levi-Strauss's classic anthropological study, in which he argues that the interplay between the categories raw and cooked is the building block of myths found across many cultures that enable reflection on the natural and the cultural. Cooking is, in essence, the cultural transformation of the raw. In my book, I show how cultural tinkering and negotiations, forms of cooking that are largely obscured by those who uh, to those who consume numbers, are central to the production of quantitative health data throughout its life course. So in what follows, I move outside of the office and into what demographers and data collection teams refer to as the field. So one of the main efforts of my book is to shift our gaze toward global health's more minor actors. So here, um, the sort of, quote, unskilled data collectors, um, such as these, who are often framed as interchangeable cogs in a larger machine of, of knowledge production since the colonial era of tropical medicine. Um, and here I'm inspired, of course, by um, Lynn Shoemaker's work 
work on um, some of the research assistants who were crucial to the production of knowledge by the Rhodes Livingston Institute. Um, and um, I'll show today that these field workers make stability, um, or, or standards of data collection uh, make stability and fixity in numerical representation possible, not despite, but because of their cu customization by, by field workers. Um, okay, so I've brought this piece of African cloth. Some of you may recognize it. Um, in Malawi, it's referred to as Zichenje. Um, so I'll be discussing that in this section. Uh, brokering and translation on the part of hundreds of field workers, my book shows, are central ingredients in data collection and add value to data. The commodification of data for consumption by researchers and policymakers has likewise commodified the kinds of expertise and know-how that are central to their collection. This has enabled Malawian secondary and college graduates to find temporary contractual employment in the world of global health research, affording some of them measures of economic and social mobility uh, through what they term living project to project. Local knowledge, often taken for granted by researchers, is performed and constructed in the space of social relations, and such performances betray the competing interests of the variety of persons who encounter one another in the contact zone of fieldwork. This excerpt from a training manual distributed by to fieldwork teams by LSAM and authored actually by um, sort of a prior generation of uh, Malawian fieldworkers rhetorically places a boundary between the voluntary counseling and testing uh, counselors, HIV test counselors, I refer to them as VCT in the book because that was the convention at the time, um, and their subjects, rural Malawians, by confining culture presented as timeless and stagnant entity to the villages and associating the power to change culture with uh, with the counselors. Likewise, in its objective to train the counselors to be good field workers, it draws a boundary between the project and its employees, solidifying and emphasizing boundaries between themselves and their employers, and between themselves and rural research participants, enables fieldwork supervisors and interviewers to preserve ownership over local knowledge and to ensure it remains valuable. Within a survey project, then, it is not just data that are produced, but identities, expertise, dreams, and hierarchies as well. So the projects I spent time with all held extremely extensive uh, training sessions for their field workers during the first week and sometimes two weeks of a field work season. So the trainings typically took place in rented facilities like local lodges um, or inns or even teacher training colleges um, or at the guest house where teams were staying for the duration of data collection. Their purpose was to encourage bonding among the field teams, to familiarize field workers with the survey and other instruments, and to standardize and harmonize data collection as much as possible. Becoming a competent field worker necessitates training as a mode of professionalization into the world of survey research. Field workers are trained to transform villages into the field, snippets of conversation into data, and rural dwellers into interviewees or respondents. Instead of initiating field workers into local culture then, these trainings initiate them into research culture and in the process facilitate new imaginings of self and other. Data collection is an endeavor that produces new kinds of social boundaries and forms of difference and revalues local knowledge. In fact, as I show in the book, it is their interactions with data and standards for its collection that field workers such as this gain the local expertise they offer to foreign researchers. Participants in training sessions co-constructed archetypal village or research subjects to facilitate their work in the field. So they kind of collectively imagined um, an ideal type of, of villager. Uh, engagement with this villager necessitated preparations and forethought as to proper comportment, behavior, and dress code on the part of field workers. One, on day two of a joint training session for LSAM interviewers and HIV counselors, Francis, the Malawian team supervisor, provided a rapid fire set of guidelines to his trainees. Quote, how do we dress for the field? We put on chitenje like this one. Um, we can't wear what we wear in the city. You have to suit the environment. Manners affect everything. Don't appear to be gossiping in front of the villagers, unquote. The supervisor closed this session by clasping his hands together and thanked the trainees for their attention, saying zikomo, or the Cheo word for thank you. This gesture was explained for the benefit of those who have, may have been unfamiliar. Um, always do, do this if you pass someone in the village or if you wish to enter someone's compound. Instructions such as these belied an assumption on the part of Malawian supervisors that field workers needed to be familiarized with or acclimated to the field, despite the fact that in LSEM's case in particular, a few data collectors were actually hired from the same rural areas and sometimes even found to be in the sample themselves. Um, as they are trained to embody a new occupational role, they are taught that they are fundamentally different, more urbane, more sophisticated, 
open-minded, more open-minded than the villagers they will be interviewing. However, Francis's instructions also point to the supervisor's interest in maintaining a boundary between themselves and their trainees. They are the experts imparting accumulated fieldwork uh, wisdom to a group of initiates. Project guidelines for dress and comportment were meticulously observed by field workers and monitored by supervisors, and clothing and actions became embodied symbols of field workers' professionalism, status, and difference from rural villagers. And LSAM interviewer, as LSAM interviewers prepared to enter the field for the first time to pilot this survey, a, zoo, a supervisor singled out a smartly dressed male interviewer who is sporting a fashionable cap to drive home a lesson. Quote, we can't be putting on hats like this one in the village. One morning, about a month later, another male interviewer was sent home to change his trousers before work. His supervisor asked him, quote, what were you thinking coming to work with those jeans with 50 cent written on them in big letters? Uh, the American hip hop artist. Interviewers, too, commented on their colleagues' attire, often in gendered fashion, uh, as when one woman was consistently singled out for choosing to wear shoes that were meant for clubbing um, in the field. Critiques of field attire such as these produce the city and the village as incommensurate places, likewise the field and the office. Um, there were people often said things like Blantyre is Blantyre, which is a city, um, and Mchinji, a village, is something else altogether. Um, in their effort to blend in with villagers, field workers employed costumes, props, and accessories. During our daily minibus journeys to the field, uh, I witnessed a ritualized collapse and maintenance of boundaries um, be, uh, sorry, between the categories of field and office and research and researcher. At about the halfway point between the field office and the field in the mornings, the women in the van tied headscarves or bandanas around their heads and knotted colorful chitenje fabric around their waists, usually uh, trousers or a skirt. At the end of the day, they sighed with relief, unwrapped their heads, and removed the now dusty chitenje. Men, too, adopted certain ritualized codes of dress and mannerisms. So they referred to their older, less fashionable sneakers as fieldwork shoes and replaced them with regular, cleaner, and more stylish shoes at the end of the day before they went um, as a group for dinner into the, uh, in the training center. During downtime in the field, supervisors often stopped to shop at weekly markets and trading centers and near sample villages for low-priced kaunjika or second-hand clothes that they referred to as field clothes. The symbolic distance between the field workers and the villagers was re-established as the minivan hurried back to the office in the evenings. So rituals of fieldwork dress were at the center of a discussion between Dr. Smith, an American public health researcher who was in Malawi with MAPES project for two weeks, and John, the supervisor for the project's data collection. Dr. Smith inquired why female field workers wore headscarves while in the fields, but not in the office. John explained it was to foster closeness to their respondents by hiding things like expensive extensions or elaborate hairstyles that village women do not have access to. To not wear the scarf, he said, would be telling them, I have a lot of money and I'm not from around here and I care too much about my hair. In practice, however, villagers could of course tell if a field worker wore her hair and extensions, even if she covered them with a headscarf. They knew she was dressing down by wearing the zetenje, for example. Interviewers gradually became skilled at using cultural diacritics to competently blend into the field and embody a certain cultural style, deploying signs in a way that positioned them in relation to social categories. And of course, even if they're not fooling anyone, dressing and undressing indicates interest in mastering the local, an endeavor at the center of professionalization into fieldwork. Fieldwork clothes and accessories may seem insignificant props in the drama of fieldwork, and some people would argue they are, but not anthropologists. But they are symbolic markers <laughs> of the investment of members of field work cultures in policing a boundary between the field and the office, the knower and the known. It is the shared agenda of the actors who make up the survey research project, producing clean data, that gives birth to new social hierarchies and status regimes that are mirrored by the spatialized narration and performance of difference. Indeed, the field itself, central unit of knowledge production, notably both in demography and anthropology, needed rhetorical containerizing to be manageable and masterable. The field was produced as a place of difference in field workers' narrations of field work as an adventure, as out of the ordinary, and as a kind of roughing it. Supervisors who tended to be from cities and college educated enjoyed fieldwork because it afforded them the opportunity to quote, discover the real Malawi. They liked that it provided opportunities to make business or other connections, to see family in other parts of Malawi, to eat new and different foods. Uh, field workers appreciated the intimate fictive kinship that developed in research cultures, often referring to their workmates as a fieldwork family. They mentioned they liked learning what rural Malawians do, being exposed to the cultural beliefs of rural people, playing 
bao, a traditional kind of game of skill that's somewhat like mancala, um, or football with young men in trading centers, listening to elder stories, uh, and learning about Chewa culture. Um, and here, uh, Chewa kind of stands in for Malawian culture um, due to Malawi's first post-independent president, um, Hastings Kamuzu Banda, kind of um, enacted a project of Chewanization, so um, kind of elevating one ethnic group's um, culture, symbolism, and so on, um, to stand in for uh, the nation. Field workers and anthropologists, for that matter, come to see the field as something outside their everyday worlds that must be embodied through discipline, training, and experience. Interviewers who are working in their own districts or villages, um, and there were a few of these in the case of Elsam, emphasize this difference in order to lend credibility to their new role as expert interviewers, to draw attention to their belonging in a community of researchers. So this role and its associated symbols, including project t-shirt, badge, uh, clipboard, canvas bag for holding soap and surveys, conferred them status and cultural capital among their peers, who, in cases where projects hired locally, might also be acquaintances or family members. Through initiation into research culture, individuals learn to see research participants as different, even as they mastered a set of techniques to commensurate themselves with the field. Training sessions produce expectations and stereotypes about village culture meant to guide the actions and interactions of field workers on the job. Throughout, manuals and training sessions objectify culture as a stumbling block to the pr progress of research in the field. Interviewers were encouraged to, quote, try not to change whatever the villagers might believe. Don't tell them it is wrong to believe in witches, for example, unquote. These sessions and the talk and rhetoric common to research worlds made culture visible to field workers by inventing it, um, containing it in the field, making it a kind of prop that could facilitate field workers' imagination that they are links or translators between two worlds glossed as the field and the office. The trainings ask interviewers to black box, cul black box culture in order to render it incapable of complicating or slowing down fieldwork. This black boxing plays a central role in what I call elsewhere seeing like a research project, where the sample is standardized and bounded unit that acts as a tidy container for data. In inventing culture as something other, field workers and supervisors shore up performances of objectivity, neutrality, and professionalism. So data collection is framed as a scientific rather than a cultural um, or political or economic enterprise. African researchers and informants have long played a central role in making African societies accessible logistically and culturally to outsiders. Northern researchers reinterpret Malawian ideas, traditions, customs, behaviors, and contexts through the prism of their training in a certain discipline and their scripted impressions of Malawi. Most influentially, however, they complement these perceptions with the local knowledge they so highly value. Yet becoming a good field worker does not necessarily entail mastering a body of stable local knowledge or being native to a geographic or cultural place, but rather learning and embodying new ways of seeing um, that rely on and reproduce difference and distance between knowers and known, science and culture, office and field. So data collection then is an endeavor shaped by and shaping of the subject objectivities, aspirations, and dreams of those who collect it. Okay, so moving on to soap, my favorite uh, object. Um, so the justification for research in impoverished settings relies on a presumption that it will improve um, the collective good or bring abstract future benefits to participants. But participants, as we will soon see, often expect that their lives in the present will be transformed. The projects discussed in my book did not provide medicine or treatment, nor did they build schools or hospitals. They did, however, give respondents to survey questionnaires a bar of soap. Um, they actually gave them two. One was life buoy and one was sunlight, this one. Um, so they, uh, in the book, I contextualize the sort of present day meanings that are assigned to soap by recipients, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis sort of legacies of colonial era civilizing um, capitalism in which soap and other commodities like it um, featured prominently. Uh, from the perspective of demographers who designed surveys and oversaw their implementation in the field and Malawian ethics board members who reviewed research proposals Soap was an ideal and clean gift. Um, ubiquitous and with small monetary value, soap does not threaten to induce participation nor to invalidate consent, gold standards of human subjects research by inducing or incentivizing participation as money uh, was thought to do. It is also less heavy to carry in field workers' bags um, than, say, one kilogram of sugar. It also wouldn't spill all over the floor, which in past years, um, when sugar was actually given as a gift, had been an 
issue. Um, SOAP is an accomplice in informed consent's ruse. It equates research subject and researcher, stripping them of social and economic trappings within a bounded contractual moment devoid of specificity. SOAP is enlisted into document-based rituals of verification that produce researchers and the researched as kind of impersonal and homogenous categories at the heart of our imaginings of ethics. While anthropologists document how research transactions of blood, information, and benefits activate multiple gift economies that come into friction, SOAP, even as it is assigned competing meanings, works because its transaction is legitimated as ethical by both participants and researchers. And for the most part, it is graciously received by participants. Indeed, um, as I discuss in more depth in the book, some people um, would fake their identities and begin responding to surveys um, in order to receive it. Um, and they would claim to be someone they weren't. Yet naming SOAP ethical does not preclude critical engagements with the ensuing production of value and knowledge from information collected. Even as SOAP appears to facilitate the collection of data and keep the gift relationship clean, it produces new kinds of subject positions, forms of value, and expectations through its transaction. So transactions in research worlds then generate new kinds of social bonds and social ruptures, and thus new kinds of social relations. For some survey respondents, SOAP was a symbol of injustice and a metaphor for failures of state and non-state administration of aid, resources, and gifts. So the distribution of this seemingly innocuous SOAP gift sometimes engendered suspicions and distrust in sampled areas. Although SOAP is a standardized gift in that all who participate receive it equally, it is interpreted as unjust because some people are left out. The lopsided social terrain of lucky insiders and unlucky outsiders created by random sampling grafts onto a landscape that is already pockmarked by other instances of uneven distribution. So people living in sample areas drew parallels, for example, between random sampling and exclusions produced by the government's annual distribution of limited fertilizer coupons to the poor, widely perceived as inefficient, corrupt, and unfair. One participant in LSAM's survey mobilized an aphorism to critique the pit pitfalls of randomization. Um, something like, maize always goes to those who don't have teeth. That is, good things are wasted when given to the wrong people. Um, another wondered why LSAM skipped houses. In Malawi, a locally fitting gift, soap, meets formal ethical standards for any single research encounter and is graciously received, but it does not necessarily address expectations that a project should not skip houses, nor does it respond to critiques that individuals and communities are entitled to more than just soap. And I should note that um, it's not that like every single project that works in Malawi gives soap. This was the case for the projects I worked with um, for the bulk of time that I was there over the two years. Um, some projects actually do give money. Some people give um, airtime units. Um, all, all sorts of other gifts are, are possible. Okay. Um, survey participants explicitly coded research and soap as rights that good citizens were entitled to, using both the English and Chewa terms when talking about these entitlements. Some of my interlocutors, for example, suggested it was their human right to receive health care or medicines if a project found them suffering. Like fertilizer coupons distributed by the state, SOAP prompts reflection on the political relationship of citizens to institutions in their midst. SOAP triggers its recipients to consider the value of information they surrender, and complaints voice needs that might be fulfilled by one among the many projects that Malawians often lump together. So it makes the mismatch between interpretations of the value of research a problem for negotiation, even as it seeks to commensurate them as mere misunderstandings. Um, and here I would sort of nod to the fact that researchers often uh, interpret refusals to participate in research um, in the language of like therapeutic misconception. Um, you know, the idea that people think they're meant to get medicine or treatment for participating in research. Um, and so part of what I'm interested in showing uh, in the book is that these refusals are actually very closely linked to people's past experiences, um, which they sort of keep a sort of an inventory of over time and, and use to sort of evaluate um, present day uh, potential participation. When I visited the household of a middle-aged man called Dominic after he refused to participate in LSAM's survey, he explained his refusal. I won't answer their silly survey questions. People already came here a few months back and some of my friends chose bottle caps with Kwacha, Malawi's currency, on them. And me, I chose a cap and it had nothing on it. If they're coming here to fool us again, just tell them not even to come. In 2004, Elsam began HIV testing respondents. Um, so that conversation was in 2008. In 2004, Elsam began HIV testing respondents in its panel survey sample because those tested would need to report to portable test center uh, 
centers two to four months after their initial test to receive the results. This was, of course, before rapid testing. LSAM implemented an experiment to determine how small monetary incentives might affect respondents' likelihood of attending test centers. The experimental design featured respondents drawing bottle caps marked with amounts ranging um, from about zero to three US dollars from a bag or a hat and receiving a voucher that would be redeemed upon their picking up of the results. In 2006, this incentives program was not implemented because of the advent and feasibility of rapid testing, which meant respondents received their results immediately. However, that same year, in 2006, LSAM initiated another incentives program, this time an HIV prevention experiment. A portion of individuals who received an HIV test in 2006 were enrolled in an incentive study, whereby they participated in another bottle cap lottery that promised them the monetary amount depicted if they maintained their HIV status for the next year. Um, in 2007, LSAM distributed these incentives, which ranged from uh, zero to about $32 at the time, based on which bottle cap a respondent had chosen back in 2006. I know it's very confusing, but I think it speaks to the way in which samples are recursively used for different projects over time. Villagers interpreted random distribution of incentives via a lottery system of choosing a bottle cap um, as unjust. Dominic, for example, felt fooled because he had not received what he felt entitled to, and feeling wronged motivated his decision to abstain from the current survey, even though it did not include incentives at all uh, in its design. Refusal to participate in research is likewise a refusal to accept the gift of soap. Yet these refusals, so long as they are not too numerous to significantly reduce sample size, may legitimate research's eth ethical claims by proving that potential subjects have the agency to choose not to participate. Uh, rather than viewing Dominic in his full personhood, Elsam encounters him as a depersonalized and categorical research participant, whose refusal, in a sense, reproduces a research community, or at least does not undo it. His refusal is not socially but numerically coded, easily digested by statistics and models that, mention, uh, that uh, measure sample retention. Dominique's critique that he did not receive money he felt entitled to and the rationale underlying his refusal to accept a gift of soap goes unaddressed by research ethics that rely on those in the sample receiving soap and others outside the sample receiving nothing. Despite researchers' efforts to clearly explain study design, Dominic casts them as a homogenous and undifferentiated group of people who seek to fool him and others like him. Moreover, while demographers often blame interviewers, as in their appearance and mannerisms, um, for refusals or non-response by respondents, Dominic indicates it is his interaction with a corporate entity the project, rather than any one individual that, that sort of mediates his refusal. Malawians um, often make little distinction between the many projects in their midst. Um, in 2000, LSAM respondents perceived survey field workers associ as associated with the National Family Planning Program, for example. Um, and uh, I, I, on some occasions, when I would turn up to a, a household, um, people would kind of bring out like a yellowing pile of documents related to research or, or consent forms um, to sort of say, oh yeah, I've participated in a lot of research. Um, and even the physical landscape, of course, carries um, certain kinds of marks or traces of research. So households sometimes have like chalk numberings from, um, you know, state or non-state sort of institutions conducting research or, or forms of counting and quantification. While some researchers suggest that survey participation could be a way to break up an otherwise in uninteresting day, participants often viewed research participation as a job, raising complaints about the value of soap in a discourse of labor, even as they continue to call the soap a gift. Many respondents complained that they saw no profit in research participation. A female LSAM participant called Grace suggested, quote, I expect more than soap because it's not equivalent to the job I do as a respondent. It's a very big job. Interviewers can ask you so many questions on so many topics, and sometimes you just reach a point where you run out of answers and just look at them. Grace is not, Grace is not paid for her time, but volunteers it ostensibly to benefit a larger community. Yet, even as research participants seem interchangeable from the perspective of projects fixated on sample size rather than individuals, people in sample areas indicated that participants can do a good or a bad job. So people would often comment on the logic of random scampling or skipping houses that, why are you talking to that person? They are the person that will completely lie to you. Or why are you talking to that person? They're the village fool, etc. cetera. Um, so um, in explicitly framing participation as working, here using um, the Chewa word, kugu 
cuidanchito, literally meaning kind of labor or working, research subjects make political claims on projects tied up in a distributive economy of care and welfare. SOAP, coded as an antonym of monetary payment, being a gift, uh, is re-signified as a commodity whose exchange value is inadequate remuneration for good work or labor. Andrews, a longtime supervisor, suggested research participants increasingly see research as a job. Quote, in Malawi, we have these rules that in research you cannot give people money, but you know, if somebody comes to your house, that could have been productive time, but yet you spent that time chatting with someone. But if someone gives them something, meaning money, they can look at it and value it and say, okay, from that job, I've got this. He notes that participants carefully calibrate time and labor and contest the legitimacy of research rules, prescriptive ethics that name money as inappropriate gift for what he sees as a job. Field workers in general sometimes voice concerns that projects they worked for relied on gifts not to build but to evade social obligations. And this is consistent um, with King Kingori and Madiga et al's findings that the field staff of medical research projects in Kenya were wary of obligations that impoverished research subjects imposed on them as kind of stand-ins or representatives for a wealthy um, project. These perspectives illustrate how a gift can be ethical when evaluated from a perspective within a research world or by an ethics board, but kind of unethical when evaluated in light of historical memory and experience in a particular time and place. Research participants also accused Malawian field workers of eating their money. They come here and instead of fetching food for the children, we sit here wasting time chatting. They go home and eat good food, rice and meat. They leave me hungry and make money as they do so. This accusation, of course, finds intertextual meaning in a history of eating money as critique leveled against elites, scammers, relatives, governments, uh, or big men in Africa who fatten themselves on the spoils of the poor or gain wealth corruptly uh, or insidiously. While respondents answer questions for up to three hours, time is money or its equivalent in food, and longer form surveys may exacerbate their frustrations with lost time. As participants experience a net loss, they see interviews, interviewers, quote, getting fat from the information and salary they're collecting. It was common for respondents to furnish interviewers with small gifts during survey administration in line with local hospitality norms. So um, these included sugarcane, ground nuts, fruits, or even a lunch of encima, the staple food. Such gifts were given without ethical compulsion in the spirit of hospitality, in contrast to the soap that flowed the other way. The soap gift aims to fast forward a social relationship that in most cases does not exist before the interviewer arrives at the household by making him seem trustworthy or kind, but frames this relationship as ethical rather than social or economic. So for research participants, projects were not only eating their time and leaving them hungry, but creating a new hunger for a better future they would likely never taste. The metaphor of eating also surfaced in accusations that research projects were sucking their research participants' blood. Um, so um, in the field seasons that I was with the projects, um, actually, in cases of all four of the projects I was with, um, researchers were in, um, accused of being opapa magazi, the Chewa word for something like bloodsuckers or vampires. Um, these stories, of course, fit into a larger trans-historical genre that demonizes dangerous others, including colonial officials, researchers, politicians, physicians, firemen, etc., who steal or accumulate bodily material or information for mysterious ends. In Malawi, these accusations have um, a very specific history as well um, and can be documented um, sort of historically over time in different contexts and um, referring to different groups of actors. Um, early African nationalist Chipembere famously referred to David Livingston as a bloodsucker. Um, in the 1920s, there were allegations that British landlords were prowling estates to find Africans to kill and eat. In times of famine, political leaders are often accused of being bloodsuckers, often by like selling maize to other countries while um, Malawi's own people are dying. Uh, accusations that arise in survey projects are helpfully read against a historical backdrop where data collection was often a means through which the colonial state sometimes forcefully extracted hut taxes. Um, in these cases, sometimes soldiers would accompany uh, surveyors. As another example, in the 1930s, unpopular agricultural mandates were enforced by agricultural extension officers who were also collecting data in many cases from households. So though previous studies of vampire stories largely focus on blood stealing by medical institutions, often clinical trials, for example, um, the stories in Malawi that I documented also placed survey responses at the center of their accusations. Tiwonge, a recent participant in a survey, framed the information she surrendered in bodily terms. Quote, Research is 
is important. The findings improve our lives. But I ask, why are the researchers stealing my voice? The soap gift is not equivalent to the voice she gives. So for Tawonge, soap may be ethical, but it is not enough. Soap for information transactions appear in project documents such as proposals or published findings as mere background or shorthand for adherence to ethical guidelines. Yet, as we see here, they play a crucial role in stabilizing and disrupting the socio-technical infrastructure in which data is made on the ground. Um, okay, and my last one uh, is, is beans. I guess I won't remember this. Um, distant from the eyes and ears of the demographers and economists who design surveys, field workers grapple with human and non-human agents, from the weather to respondents who lie, that threaten to clean data, that threaten clean data. A field work then places a set of demands on perception, subjectivity, and performances uh, that help materialize data. So in the book, I trace how researchers' scientific and aesthetics investments uh, in pure, clean data, symbolically represented in surveys that could be read as a recipe for data collection, are made and unmade by practices and processes on the ground. So in addition to linguistic translation, which um, affords a lot of attention uh, in, in survey administration, um, survey design and fine tuning also necessitate attention to what could be called sort of accurate cultural translation. So making sure people hear in the broadest sense uh, any given question or instrument um, correctly. So one section of LSEM's uh, per survey assessed respondents' subjective expectations of future outcomes like HIV infection, economic shocks, or illness. Researchers suggest that understanding such expectations is crucial to designing and evaluating policies in health, education, and so on. In an attempt to ensure clarity of meaning of probability for a low literacy sample of rural Malawians, LSAM implemented an exercise that came to be known as Niemba Niemba, um, beans reduplicated, among fieldwork teams and research participants. Respondents were asked to place a certain number of beans in a dish um, to estimate how likely it was that they would, for instance, experience a food shortage or contract HIV AIDS. So you would put one bean if it was unlikely to happen and 10 if it was certain to happen. Um, and you can see here, um, um, question X to be sort of, you know, is the exact one, what is the probability sort of that you're infected with HIV AIDS right now? Um, and you can see how worse for the wear this is from just traveling in my backpack to various places. So um, the, the thing was, uh, beans were often lost. Um, the, the dishes also got messed up and things like that. Um, Researchers consider the beans to be intuitive and engaging for respondents, and um, existing literature validates it as a tool that promises to increase quality of data collected from an imagined villager. Um, it's said that it reduces the bulking of answers, so it makes it less likely that someone would respond zero or 10, um, which is a, a problem in uh, probability questions. Um, it increases internal validity and consistency. Uh, it has low non-response rates, uh, et cetera. Respondents and field workers respond Responses to the beans, however, were largely negative. Uh, research participants tended to view the beans as infantilizing. Um, some people would say, if you want to go play, go over there with the children. Um, and the beans were a site of friction between actors across different scales of the project. So fieldwork supervisors negotiated carefully between top-down efforts to standardize implementation of this activity, um, their own skepticism about the beans, and complaints from their field workers that the beans were silly, time-consuming, and boring for respondents. Supervisors chastise their interviewers. Improve your attitudes. The bad morale among these research participants is coming from you. These guys observe us. They can tell you think Nyemba Nyemba is worthless, and this allows them to protest against it. They occasionally spied on field workers as they interviewed respondents to ensure they were not cheating the project by failing to do Nyemba Nyemba, or even just filling in numbers at random, of course, the most flagrant form of cooking data. However, at nightly meetings with American researchers, the Malawian supervisors suggested that the beans exercise deemed by demographers to be a culturally relevant uh, instrument was a misfit with Malawian culture. So my field notes recorded at households where Nyemba Nyemba was implemented highlight issues that arose when this tool, oh, sorry. Oh, it's, it's just black right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So um, so the, the sort of field notes that I recorded at um, some instances where this tool was, was implemented um, kind of highlight some of the frictions that arose and, and sort of shows how the numbers recorded in the boxes in this bean section are contingent and unsettled render renderings of the realities they claim to enumerate. So Topeka, a 24-year-old LSAM female interviewer, interviewed a 35-year-old man, Josiah, in a village in central Malawi. The pair and I sat behind his house on a mat he set out on the ground, 
and the survey interview proceeded smoothly until we reached the beans exercise. Although he was initially a bit baffled by the instructions, asking, should I really do this, move the beans around, um, can I just answer the questions, he was a relatively willing participant. Halfway through the long section, however, he grew tired and began to mention numbers without manipulating the beans. Topeka, frustrated, proceeded to pick up the number of beans he mentioned each time and put them in the dish, indicating he should continue to manipulate the beans. Josiah grew increasingly annoyed, and the defeated Topeka completed the section without the beans. She felt compelled to perform the scripts and standardized implementation of the beans she had learned in training sessions, not least for the benefit of the anthropologist, me, in her presence. Topeka's desire to be identified as a good field worker trying to deal with a difficult research subject um, performs the, her absorption of the project's vision to collect accurate and reliable data, captured in a phrase that was often repeated at trainings, quote, you are the project. A close reading of Topeka and Josiah's encounter, touching, manipulating, and debating the beans, exposes accurate data as inherently cooked. The numbers scrawled on the survey page and subsequently aggregated with those supplied by other respondents to other interviewers are provisional and improvised artifacts of social negotiation. And Topeka, the reluctant bean counter in the scenario, makes uh, efforts to ensure each bean is counted for the sake of data quality as she was taught. The Nyamba Nyamba exercise to anthropologists and Topeka may seem to resemble a divination session, throwing the bones or casting lots, more than a scientifically validated tool for collecting better data. Um, Helen Varan's insight that, quote, numbers are a ragged hold all for a multitudinous set of things done or performed differently in myriad times and places is helpful here. Nonetheless, despite all of this, the bean worked and worked quite well. They made data, and the frictions described here were excised as kind of non-data, never recorded onto the survey page. In the same way that field workers are taught to conceive of the field as separate from, distant from, and different from the office, the sample is imagined as autonomous and disconnected from the world around it, an entity whose borders should be patrolled and purity protected at all costs. Yet in practice, maintaining sample purity entails artfully navigating blurred lines between sample and not sample. For example, field teams attended funerals in the villages from which the project sample was drawn to pay condolences and give monetary donations, sometimes from their own pocket. Uh, in the event of a death, data collection would be delayed. Field workers were discouraged from just sitting in the minibus and encouraged to get to know the people living in research areas. Field workers enjoyed meals offered them by re uh, survey respondents, engaged in business transactions with local people, for example, purchasing honey, fruit, tea, or local chickens. Um, they gave sick people rides to the hospital uh, they helped women pound maize, they played football with young people, and compensated people um, when accidents would happen, such as the SUV or minibus running over a cooking pot, for example. Small interactions like these elongate relationships and build trust and reciprocity between a project and its sample. Even as the project itself focuses its purifying gaze myopically on the sample as unit of value from which clean data emerge, the production of this value is contingent on forging the right kinds of relations with those within and outside that unit. And this labor is, of course, the purview of data collectors who are cast as liabilities often, but in actuality are central to the production of high quality data. Um, so just some concluding thoughts. Um, some of what I've pre presented to today is descriptive. Um, I've aimed to model what we might see if we track the social lives of data. So perhaps it is this kind of attention to the processes, practices, and political economies of data infrastructures that might enhance our understanding, too, of the epiphenomena big data, or prompt us to question the common association between volume and utility that gives data its currency their currency. At first glance, big data seems very different than pencil and paper surveys administered in rural Malawi, so-called small data. Yet I hope my book can, read alongside other excellent work in critical data studies, act as a kind of toolkit or primer from which we might find tools, concepts, and methods that can help us understand data, big or small, as material objects with histories rather than free-floating objective black boxes. Data themselves um, are a field site amenable to cultural critique and ethnographic interpretation, as Tom Bolstrow argues. The practice of making data for all field workers, including anthropologists, relies on closely managing relationships with the people, things, and ideas in their midst. It was through quite literally touching quantitative data, so scrawling my initials on log forms like this one, you can see my initials there, um, marking surveys with red pens, packing cars with clipboards and boxes of soap, that I began to care about data. My time with survey projects made tangible the claims of science study scholars that data, quantitative or ethnographic, do not exist independently 
of ideas, technologies, people, and contexts that conceive of, produce, and analyze them. A longtime Malawian supervisor on survey projects once told me, exasperation after a long day in the field, my life is data. His words carry multiple valences and drive home the importance of anthropological study of not just how numbers get things wrong or right, which is kind of the dominant way anthropologists have approached numbers, but what worlds, relations, and futures they might bring into being. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great question. Um, so I think that um, on the whole, so one interesting thing that I'll start with is that I think a lot of the literature that I'm in conversation with in medical anthropology and critical global health studies and so on um, kind of presumes that these kinds of projects kind of fly in and sort of just do their thing and then leave, which, you know, certainly comes up and, and you know, definitely the research participants are sort of like, but we've gotten nothing from, from this research over all these years. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to note that um, a lot of the infrastructure that exists comes back again and again year after year. So, you know, people in uh, the sample, you know, many of them actually sort of have a certain <laughs> intimacy with at least the, the face of the project. And this depends on the project. You know, at the same time, they're like projects, projects, projects. They also, you know, say, oh, we, we know this project. They've been coming for so long since the 90s. Um, and, you know, so some of that would figure into like the level of reluctance, resistance, or refusal. Also, the skillfulness of the, the research assistants, the field workers, like in sort of finessing uh, encounters that were sort of going southward. Um, you know, I think questions that really, that people were reluctant to answer, I think they had more to do with um, almost you know, form than content. So things that were particularly like tiresome, like the beans, people just like hated um, and would begin to say like, I don't really want to keep doing this. Um, but you know, the questions about sex, so how many times have you had sex this month, um, which, you know, are questions like that one, which, you know, indeed are like very sensitive. Um, you know, I think that was again, a part of the, the role of the field worker was really to finesse those encounters, like sort of knowing that was an awkward question. But I think, you know, the, the sort of, um, the sort of hidden secret there is that, yeah, these numbers are just unsettled renderings in the same way that someone asking me that question, I mean, you know, um, what would I say? <laughs> like, and who, how would that change if the person asking me was this person or this person? Um, people often also, I think, maybe overemphasize interviewer effects. Um, so, you know, demographers are very interested in, oh, well, if like we have a young woman interviewing an older man or a man interviewing a woman, which, you know, certainly is important, but overall I found that you know and this is of course anecdotal because I don't have a I don't do the statistical analysis of matching up someone's you know gender or co-ethnicity or whatever but you know I found that um, it was it was really you know more uh, it was ambiguous and a lot of actually the demographic studies of you know differences in ethnicity or gender or whatever um, are, are likewise ambiguous there's not very many connections um, one of my colleagues has done a study in Malawi and found you know people speak really differently about ethnicity if the person 
person interviewing them is also from that same ethnic group. Um, they also will elevate um, sometimes, you know, from the interviewers themselves who have this treasure trove of knowledge as well. They had a sense of like, oh, that person is from this ethnic group. So when he told us he had 10 sexual partners, um, that's just a total lie. You know, they're such braggers um, like that. Those kind of stereotypes really played in. And, you know, of course, that wasn't captured even as, as metadata formally. But, you know, people would really comment on moments like that. But overall, um, you know, I, I did sit in on quite a number of interviews and, you know, I was there as well, right? Like, how does that change it? And um, the, the projects gave me random samples because they were worried that my presence would alter um, the, the responses in the, in the sample. So I had to actually um, go to random households. And even when I did interviews, follow-up interviews that were my research assistant called research on research interviews, um, people were always like, who's going to research you? Um, but, you know, those were also random households because they were so concerned that, like, me visiting, you know, the same like you know households in the same area or something would would mess things up. But um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question, but sensitive questions. I you know I I also don't think I think that would be really interesting to look at um, to trace over time in a way that like perhaps anthropologists could actually engage you know more deeply the actual quantitative data because these archives do exist and they're very accessible um, and sort of like thinking through you know given the kind of like thick data I have about this particular about two particular field seasons for these projects and sort of thinking about, you know, how the, the responses and the, the values over time change um, might be like an interesting exercise. I can't really say I have, like off the top of my head, you know, how, what questions have made people uncomfortable, but, you know. It's just such an extraordinary historical mm -hmm. transformation in the space of 60 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the census, um, it, yeah, the census like does intersect some of these projects, but it's it's definitely not as data intensive. Like the number of questions and things. Like the year I was there, the census was actually taking place, so they'd actually kind of run into each other. The the field workers and some of the field workers actually were working for both. Um, were kind of eating from both sides and like working, trying to work for the census and these projects, and that that wasn't allowed by the projects. But yeah, so thinking about how those things overlap as well. But. Mm -hmm. hey, thanks. Hey. Um, thanks. Um, I was, as you were talking, I do research in Cambodia, and I mm -hmm. also do kind of research on research, and so I mm -hmm. heard a lot of kind of similar stories about um, uh, wanting the kind of data as the, a value, mm -hmm. sort of like we're do, this is whether it's conceived of the participation part, which is labor that should mm -hmm. be compensated, or kind mm -hmm. of the data as a, a value. And you use the term materiality, and I was curious to just to hear more about that. Like, is the material mm -hmm. about, there's the beans, is it about mm -hmm. blood? Like, mm -hmm. the idea of blood, or the, the discussion of blood, the reality of the blood? Mm -hmm. But just maybe a little more elaboration about that. Sort of yeah, yeah. And what, what else would it add to our like, mm -hmm. why does it help us to think about the material? Yeah, so I think uh, part of your question, I think, brings up um, kind of questions of like epistemic or disciplinary framing and, and what it is that we uh, see from our, our various perspectives when we enter into these kind of socio-technical assemblages. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit, like what might have looked different if I had been trained as a demographer. I think what would have caught my eye were probably really different things. So. Um, what stood out for me were um, these kind of tiny material objects that um, I thought nonetheless really helped orchestrate certain kinds of relations and could be useful um, devices through which to kind of tell stories about the kinds of relations and transactions that built up around them or the kinds of commentary or discourse that um, you know was generated by them so things like you know soap and clipboards and like the paper of the surveys themselves um, the kind of palimpsest of decaying consent forms um, and you know but I think when I talk about the materiality um, of, of data itself, I have to go back to the first slide, but um, yeah, I think part of what I'm trying to get at there is at least for, um, I think, you know, for anthropologists who are, you know, writing in this realm of, of data and whether small or big, I think, and, and for the general person, right, for anyone, um, you know, data initially seems too big to wrap our heads around. And so what I was kind of trying to do was what I, when I say materiality, I think I mean things like, you know, there, there literally are kind of checks and balances and push and pull um, for any one sort of 
one you know answer, one response, one number that's filled in, one code. Um, it's seen and touched and engaged with by numerous people, um, and you know, weirdly, including me. Um, you know, who I was. Um, one of the main things I did was check surveys in the field, which you know entails kind of making sure the responses are sort of consistent um, or seem viable or um, you know are not necessarily or that questions weren't skipped, right? And so I think um, thinking about the, the ways in which, for example, this stands in where you know different people would check their initials and it would be touched by all those people and so on, um, you know, sort of thinking about the materiality of data in that sense, um, and and thinking about the immense labor that goes into you know thinking about like the filling in of a household roster, um, the writing practices that come about, so you know uh, the things sort of outside just um, just the survey itself and and what comes out of it. Um, but you know, trying to as much as possible not see debt as this like free floating thing, and think about and and a lot of people kind of. I, I think my book in in the end, um, you know, now that I wrote it, and I, I, I think it's actually more or what what motivated my interest in it was more data writ more largely, and um, you know, uh, my frustrations with all sorts of things, including the neoliberalization of the academy, and like, you know, making faculty fill out surveys that rank departments, you know, against one another. And like, how is an anthropologist supposed to rate the usefulness of physics? I mean, I, I generally, I think gen generally, I think it's like more useful, obviously. But um, you know, am I going to write that in the survey box if my job's on the line? You know, so so I, I think for me, I, you know, my book, like, I kind of envision it being being interesting and useful and, and telling a certain story that um, might prompt people, um, even you know, readers that are not academics, potentially, I hope, um, to, to sort of just think about like, oh, wow, I never knew that like, all this stuff went into data. Um, so, you know, and that's why I sort of say my book isn't really a critique of demography. Um, it's so much. I mean, I also think it's trying to destabilize what we mean by critique and get us to rethink. You know, anthropology has always been this handmaiden to like quantitative projects, um, and it's like, oh well, anthropologists tell me what's really going on, or like, how can I improve this thing, right? Like to make it work better. And you know, I think that's fine and good, and I think there's a lot of wonderful anthropological um, work that has sort of worked to translate back and in a feedback loop to say like, oh, this is what needs to change. But, but I also. Think I think um, you know maybe that this moment of data can help anthropologists like reconfigure the kind of slot that we put ourselves into um, and think about what it like or what does interdisciplinarity look like in the era of big data and I, I think that like you guys are all thinking about these things but you know I think um, you know trying to from my own field which is really kind of medical anthropology and critical global health studies uh, trying to bring up some of those points because we rub up against this like well what does it mean to be useful um, and you know I mean is there yeah is there a usefulness and you know destabilizing like of course anthropology can say well this question was mistranslated but I found that demographers and field workers and everyone else could also say that <laughs> so it's it's more about you know kind of telling a story I mean you know and I'm not valorizing demographers I'm also not valorizing anthropologists but you know um, I think thinking about the frames and you know the ways of seeing that sort of both enable and constrain what we're able to do from whatever our situated position is is like why I wrote the book kind of <laughs> So, I have a question, but I also want to pause for a second, so anybody who does need to leave can go if you have to oh, yeah. willing to stick Sorry. Case. Yeah, I, I think I went a little long. That's great, but um, if there needs to be a reshuffling, we can let that kind of settle out. And maybe I'll start asking my question. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm really interested that you were kind of given this random sample. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts on like how that may have affected, mm -hmm. like how, the, how that was different mm -hmm. from, you know, being in in a single place and getting to know yeah. the community yeah, and yeah. To, to know your research participants through your social connections with other people. Like mm -hmm. how, did, how do you think that influenced your lens and what you found in the field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that that's a great question. So yeah, first of all, um, what's also interesting about that me being assigned the random sample is that, um, so particularly in the case of um, MAPE, whom I worked with um, after LSAM, or maybe that was before LSAM, but anyway, um, in, in that case, uh, when I was assigned the random sample, the infrastructure of the project had like 
departed. <laughs> so I was then kind of made to, myself and my research assistant were sort of made to like find the households on our own, but we were using the tools that the project had to do that. So, you know, they have like hand-drawn maps that are the, this kind of archive of like accumulated fieldwork knowledge where people, you know, um, instead of using like GPS coordinates, they have those as well, but they often aren't as useful as the drawings of like, here's a kiosk and then behind this school is like the household. And um, so I would kind of use those and it was a real struggle. And it made me realize that, um, you know, it made me think a lot about, you know, again, I'm a medical anthropologist and most of the work in medical anthropology these days, particularly in Africa, is kind of um, institutionalized in a certain way. So people work with NGOs or clinical trials or demography products or global health interventions. And, you know, it made me think about what that means for, for anthropology, because when I was without like the infrastructure, first of all, like it was much harder. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, then I was like, wow, yeah, like I really, um, you know, it, it made visible to me like what became legible because I was part of the research infrastructure itself um, or what was more easily accessible to me. I also, um, in the case of one project, they also asked me to give the same gift. So um, I had asked like, oh, do you care, can I give like, a nicer kind of soap because this is like not a very nice soap and um, and they were they said no 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 please just give the same exact gift and so here I was kind of asking people who had just participated in the survey maybe a few weeks before um, to like you know give me their litany of complaints about soap and then I was like thank you um, which is you know very <laughs> Which is like, and, and, and yeah, and I thought a lot about that. Like I, I thought about a lot about like my research design. I mean, not as much as demographers do, I guess, but you know, and I, I thought about like staying in one, one place and even seeing like, uh, you know, in the space of a certain number of months, like how many projects would come through and how people talked about them and stuff. And I tried to get some of that information like in, in the discussions I had and um, my, my research assistant and I would be like generally in the same area for a few weeks. But, um, but yeah, I think there's like benefits and detriments to both, to both models. Um, and I think, you know, part of anthropology is also kind of in, in the historical sense or the classical sense, so like a longitudinal science, um, you know, in the sense that you have many anthropologists who get very attached to their sort of field site. But, you know, for the most part, um, I thought a lot about that, that shift in anthropology, especially in medical anthropology, where, you know, anthropology is really institutionalized. I mean, it's, it's been com kind of cannibalized and cannib cannibalizing like global health. Um, and, and what does that mean for the kinds of knowledge we produce? And, you know, I think there are, again, benefits and detriments, like we see certain things, um, but like miss out on others. Um, and I think yeah, the last thing I'll say, if, if there are any anthropologists in the room, but um, are there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like those people are probably most interested in this question. But like I think medical anthropology recently has kind of turned away from um, more traditional topics of study, like in this kind of almost moment of like fear of being too culturalist. Like so people are now interested in, you know, power structures and political economy and like materiality and objects. And so, you know, focusing, for example, on like traditional healers or medical pluralism or what people do to sort of get healed and things, um, you know, I think both logistically um, and just sort of in terms of knowledge production and what is faddish or not, um, those things have kind of fallen out as uh, being sort of legible or interesting kinds of projects. So, um, you know, I think uh, these days to get funding in anthropology as well, like your project has to be legible and to be legible, you know, you have to be talking about um, data or global health. And I will say that when I started my project like um, data was not like as cool so it just I, I just was like like somehow and like you know I don't know now it's like become a thing but um, yeah so I don't know if that answers but yeah hi, hi Nora um, so Mm -hmm. the future. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about sort of what an anthropological lens can mm -hmm. help us do in terms of tracing, in particular, like mm -hmm. how this data gains monetary value mm -hmm. um, and social value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So one, um, one thing I'll say that, you know, my book doesn't do, um, or like a glaring omission, I guess, which I just didn't 
have the data to talk about um, is is thinking about sort of data editing and you know um, the the processes of anal analyzing and packaging and scrubbing and all of that stuff data data entry even I did do some data entry but not enough to sort of you know uh, write write anything about it in, in any significant way. So I think um, some of the work that others are doing on that, like Aaron Lay's work, and um, is is sort of really useful as like kind of a um, you know what happens next. Um, but in terms of the the social lives of data afterwards, I mean, I think that what. <laughs> what anthropologists can can, can contribute and again I don't want to make anthropology too much of like <laughs> um, I guess too much of a handmaiden to, to like other projects that necessarily presumes a kind of hierarchy where anthropology is like you know so I don't want to say metadata but like maybe para data like data alongside like sort of thick description that can uh, be linked to these kind of like data sets um, and you know I, I find that um, you know, I hope so. So the demographers I worked with, you know, sort of um, my work is like often circulated or posted, you know, alongside demography work or you know like shared in those communities. And um, you know, I don't necessarily think people are going to be like, oh, this is useful. Let's like fix demography. But like, I but I think it can, you know, in in the future, it would it would be like one story that tells a different story about a data set that you know uh, people draw this distinction between big and small data. But you know, I think. I think um, this kind of data is also, like I said, returned to you and like used for questions that have not yet been asked because it's such a sort of comprehensive list of um, you know things that can be correlated or questions that can be asked and um, and I've actually like generated um, papers in across disciplines on the data because people will be giving a paper about Malawi somewhere and I'm like oh you should look at like LSAM's data set because they have all this data on like you know patrilineality and like so political scientists and demographers have like I've actually told them to use the data. So so, um, so you know, I think like I, I would hope that I think for all of these kinds of big projects that many of us are studying, that you know, we it, it's not that it's a corrective to or a critique in the sense of disavowal or negativity, but like a, a thick a thick storytelling um, appendage that can be brought to bear on those things that all have histories and that we're part of that history. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why is it that you think that these developers have such a hard time seeing and hearing things like these former facts? Like, why do they go in so convinced that the beans are going to work? I mean, again, I, I think it's all um, ways of seeing. So it's how people, it's it's the kinds of things around, you know, anthropology is a genre of research that is slow by nature, that um, can see different things by virtue of the resources accessible to it, by virtue of what's considered good research in anthropology, by virtue of disciplinary conventions around the time spent. So I think that a lot of times, you know, demographers, the way that demographers get knowledge and that it's validated to get knowledge in your field. You know, I spoke with many demographers who wanted to stay in Malawi for way longer than they were able to, but that's that doesn't count toward tenure. That doesn't count toward, um, for demographers, field work is just like kind of a, a few day excursion, right? Um, or that's how it's seen in the field as far as my, you know, my interlocutors would, would explain to me back then. And like, so, you know, I think that um, the beans, as I mentioned, you know, they were validated because they, they did the kinds of things that they were meant to do for demographers, right? Which doesn't mean that they're accurately capturing a reality, but the data they're collecting is good according to the standards that are evaluating that data. So I think that, um, yeah, again, it's just ways of, ways of seeing. So um, for, for us, you know, or for anthropologists seeing this encounter and these transactions, you know, it seems almost absurd. But, you know, likewise, if demographers were to look at some of the things we do, like they would also think it was absurd. So, you know, I'm not trying to be like relativist or whatever, but I, but I think, you know, it's, it's all about like the epistemic frames that we look upon things with. Like a validation test on the bean method? Well, they, they piloted it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they pilot it. And, you know, like the thing is too, it's also thinking about sort of the, um, I guess the, some of the, what's that word, like intransigence of research infrastructure. It's simultaneously flexible, you know, as you talk about, but it's also got certain things that um, are really difficult 
to change. So, you know, there are certain interests that come into sections of the survey being added in a given year. Um, those might be funding interests, like certain sections of the survey are linked to certain funding. Um, you know, there, there are also different actors in the infrastructure who are like more powerful than others. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I mean, the, the interviewers were often cr had critiques themselves that they would bring to the researchers. And, you know, occasionally I would say, oh, like things didn't go too well today or whatever. Um, but, you know, I think they were, there's a tension between being able to just sort of change or fix that thing and having, you know, needing the, the data to be consistent if it's already been collected. So, um, so yeah, you know, it's like that give and take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like the themes, mm -hmm. you're ascribing, okay, well, a good participant is someone who will willingly undertake this exercise, mm -hmm. who wants to participate, and mm -hmm. a bad participant or a mm -hmm. actually, you know, bragging of false participant is someone who doesn't want to or rolls their eyes, mm -hmm. or, um, like the case that you described, is mm -hmm. someone who halfway through is like, okay, I'm done with this, mm -hmm. and perhaps that in and of itself is a way of um, like thinking about deserving this or like the mm -hmm. goodness of research participants, and if you perform well, then perhaps you're someone who will, who will have other mm -hmm. researchers come back. You mm -hmm. can become a site that's referred to. But the members so, are terrified of people getting, like, getting up in the middle of a survey. <laughs> I, mean, but I think it's, that, I think it's Which, about that flipping of the survey. Well, and I think what, what this conversation brings up is just the profound ambivalence that's inherent in, in research, right? Because, you know, I, I talk a lot about the complaints. I talk a lot about, you know, Dominic. And Dominic is an outlier. So m for, like, all intents and purposes, all of the projects I spent time with had very high response rates. Very high. Very impressive, right? And that is a lot of the finessing and, and work of the, the research assistants in particular. Um, so again, destabilizing, right, like notions of informed consent because right you know if you're sort of engaging someone and saying like oh like come on you know like this isn't so bad um, you know right like what does that mean for, for ethics and so on but that happens everywhere right it doesn't just happen um, in Malawi but um, but yeah and I think you know thinking about about the beans and also the soap so everyone wanted soap everyone wanted to be in the sample even though there was this kind of discourse of um, critique or complaint you know people were very interested in they, they for the most part always wanted to be in the sample because it might be linked to future benefits yet unknown um, you know uh, being part of something versus not part of something, so, um, and, and getting soap, yeah, so, you know, pretending to be someone you're not, and um, some people would, there was uh, one year in the LSAM survey, not the year I was there, where um, accidentally they, like, double sampled and, and, you know, would go to the household twice, and in, like, 95% of the cases, people didn't say anything, <laughs> so they just, like, did it twice, um, right? So there are certain kinds of like ambivalences built in. So it's not like it's good or it's bad or people like it or dislike it. Um, but for the most part, people were grateful for the soap and everyone pretty much participated, even though they were also like, these people are bloodsuckers or soap sucks. Yeah. So yeah, Kesha. So um, also talk, it's really fun to see this even with you in Malawi <laughs> So I am now in the global health space, and mm -hmm. I wonder if any of your your work in this project or since has kind of examined the role of senior Malawian researchers and academics, mm -hmm. um, who I think are a very sought after group mm -hmm. um, from like, from the sort of knowledge of the global health researcher mm -hmm. and a group that you know the brain drain rhetoric is constantly trying mm -hmm. to create and populate and sort of who, like what their role is and mm -hmm. uh, sort of mediators and how they legitimize these projects. I'm really curious about your take on that. Yeah, so that's a great question. I do talk a bit, uh, I think it's in chapter one, about kind of, um, you know, these, the, the sort of co-PIs, the, the role of the co-PI. Um, and so in, in the time frame that we're talking about, yeah, I mean, like people, and, and this is part of 
the kind of gutting of the University of Malawi, like the history, um, which is common to many um, African universities in particular, where you have the rise of like social science research centers. Um, so the Center for Social Research at the University of Malawi, um, which is kind of a, con a condensing and a move away from like departments and a move away from um, the ability to kind of do um, more academic research and the kind of uh, the creeping consultancies that uh, these folks are involved in. Um, and you know, consultancies literally pay in like two days, right? Like more than one's entire month salary. Um, you know, so the the kind of movement away from a certain mode of knowledge production and toward a sort of gray literature or a kind of you know project to project lifestyle on their part as well. Um, th during the time I was with these projects over those those two years, the the co PIs didn't really. They would maybe come to the field like once or twice. Um, they were meant to do certain percentages of time doing things and you know for the most part um, they were frankly so busy that they weren't necessarily able to do so. The biggest um, or the, the time when uh, the co -PIs most participated in uh, the sort of social lives of data was um, during like survey design and uh, translation and, and that, that period sort of before the training of the field workers where the survey would usually be brought in some pretty much completed form, but we would sit around and, you know, just the supervisor, maybe one or two supervisors and like the co-PI and the, the American or European uh, researchers and kind of go through each question. And they usually were there. And that's because it was often in the capital or it was often at the university. So it was easier for them uh, to, to get there. But um, what you bring up, I think, is is really important but amid the rise of like this celebratory discourse of collaboration, um, you know. And I think it, it also points to stuff that's been more recently for me, like a little disturbing. Um, and I think some of the racialized discourses around, um, you know, even for example in Malawi, like the culture of per diems, um, you know, or um, stuff around audit or stuff around, you know, things like that. I, I think they often, that those discourses kind of embed like discourses of racialized suspicion or, you know, revive these figures of like lazy Africans. And it's kind of like, well, <laughs> well, no, um, you know, this kind of drive for collaborators is actually the, the sort of Paris and cannibalizing thing um, and you know really actually takes people away from work that they find in many cases like really meaningful um, or that may be their own kind of you know long time research uh, agenda and plan and, and they end up slotting themselves in you know I think it's been much better in recent years like since I was doing this work there's been a lot more sort of inclusion of um, co PIs on published papers even some of the supervisors as you know from from um, th this particular project are also often co-authors on papers now but you know you also have to ask those questions about what that means and you know how that also itself becomes a commodity to sort of add an element of local collaboration um, yeah so I think um, you know I'm now working in the I'm now working with um, an organization that does LGBT rights stuff uh, in, in Lilongwe Malawi's capital and um, in 2015 the Global Fund dispersed the largest ever amount of funds to any country or organization to Malawi but it was contingent on them including meaning um, key populations in their national prevention uh, and, and policy um, and so that's had like all these really interesting effects in that sector where you have um, you know a previously reviled organization um, suddenly kind of rising to the top and, and everyone wants to be involved with them um, and you know the number of like when I was last there the number of Skype calls you know at the hotel that I would accompany my, my friend who runs the organization you know of sort of academic researchers is wanting to set up projects and partnerships and you know so those kind of things are, are interesting to like document and, and think about and I and I think um, I don't really have an answer but I, I think overall you know people are collaborating on upwards of like 20 in a country like Malawi especially um, especially where there are so few people with PhDs and so few people even with master's degrees I mean it's a bit different than Kenya or South Africa in that regard and so you know I think um, some of the solutions are I guess um, projects you know, funding them to, to do PhDs. I, I mean, I think that's great. I think that's probably the most useful yeah. thing. Yeah, I think <laughs> even, even like my collaborators in Kenya, like who would collaborate, I think, I mean, I, I think I have mm -hmm. a lot of critiques of like what it is yeah. to have a co-PI, and like even in Kenya, mm -hmm. like playing projects mm -hmm. have a clinical load and are doing mm -hmm. other things inside gigs. So mm -hmm. that's the reality of life. And so, you know, the, the 
and yes, we, we have programs where we train people and then they go back to the mm -hmm. underpaid academic position where they are mm -hmm. from one NIH fund to another, yeah. right? And so I, I just think mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that group and what the identity and role it ends up being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something I, sorry, I really try to work with my students on. I teach the anthropology of good intentions as a seminar at, at Oberlin. And like, you know, it's so interesting, their impulse to, to sort of really celebrate collaboration and like local knowledge and expertise. And so that's something really dicey to like to work with students about and to think about, you know, what is a collaborator and like how has that become a thing in a larger geography of aid and like history of extraction and, um, you know, and, and the impulse that they have, I think, to take for granted, like localness or local knowledge or expertise, and not think about it necessarily as performed within this larger infrastructure, um, and so on. But yeah. Thank you so much for Thank coming, you. everybody. <laughs> So we, um, we had a couple of cancels.